It's good to see some of you I haven't seen for a while, and it's good to see all of you here today. Um, we have been going through the book of John, and uh, we're going to continue this morning. Um, now, the setting for the message that we have is in John chapter 9, that's our text, um, Jesus has just finished miraculously healing a man who had been born blind. So this man's eyes were completely opened by the supernatural touch of Jesus. So the issue that we are going to be talking about today, you see, Jesus didn't do things exactly the way that the religious leaders of that day thought that he should do them. As a matter of fact, Jesus healed this man, restored his sight completely on the Sabbath day. And that was a problem for the religious leaders. So let's just uh, bow in a word of prayer here before we start. God, we praise you and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to open your word. God, you, we know that you have a plan for this word this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help me to ex exposit it in a way that's honoring to you and that the people here would glean what you would like to, to share with them this morning. God, our hearts are turned to you this morning and we thank you for the, the beauty and the depth of knowledge and wisdom in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, sometimes God decides that he's going to do something marvelous and supernatural in the physical to try and get our attention in the spiritual. So, this miracle that Jesus performed with the healing of this man at the pool at Bethsaida, Bethsaida, Beth, hmm, not sure quite why I'm not able to pronounce that this morning, Bethsaida, Bethsaida, there we are. <laughs> so he healed this man at the pool of Bethsaida. Boy, okay, we'll move on. <laughs> instead, they, instead of being overjoyed with what God had done, They looked at him with a critical mind. Jesus had done something that was different than their religious traditions. Now these Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law were very educated when it came to the Jewish Old Testament. They had studied it. They had come up with formulas on how everything worked. And they had actually formed traditions around the teachings in the Old Testament that went beyond the scope of what was written. You see, Jesus healed this broken man on the Sabbath day. And instead of looking at this as a miracle that uh, should cause everyone to rejoice, they closed their hearts towards him because they thought that healing someone on the Sabbath day was doing work. And because Jesus had done work on the Sabbath day, he was breaking a commandment of God. So they actually were critical of the Lord for doing things differently than their human traditions, which they had learned from their learned teachers over the years, had taught them. And when Jesus broke out of that mold that they had formed, they couldn't accept that he was of God. Many of them concluded that they must be right and he must be wrong. So here we are in the book of John chapter 9, starting with verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, 
and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. So at this point we see the Pharisees were divided. How could a man appearing to breach the Sabbath law be from God? Yet here is this man who was born blind, and now he can see. Now this man whose eyes were opened, he didn't yet realize the true um, identity of Jesus, but he knew enough to know that he was a spokesperson from God. He knew that what had happened to him was an incredible miracle, and he felt extremely blessed to be able to see the world finally. So the question is this. Did Jesus break the Sabbath law that he had established or not? Earlier in his ministry, Jesus made it very clear in Matthew chapter 5, 17, and this is a principle in the Word, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. From the Ten Commandments, uh, we know that God has commanded His children to keep the Sabbath and to keep it holy. On the seventh day of every week, the Israelites were commanded by the law of Moses to rest and to remember that God created the universe in six days and on the seventh day he rested. It was an honor to, to obey the Lord, Lord God and rest on the seventh day. The seventh day had been given for the benefit of the people as a rest from their labor. Recovery and reflection was to be done on that day of the goodness of of God and the graciousness of God in supplying all of our needs. So, this was the principle that God had established. There was another time where Jesus and his disciples were walking through grain fields and it happened to be on a Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so as they walked through the grain fields, they plucked the heads of grain in the grain fields and they began to eat the kernels of grain. As they went along, the Pharisees, however, saw what was happening and they criticized Jesus' disciples sharply for doing so. In Mark chapter 2, 27 and 28, we see, Then he said to them, Jesus said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. But as in that case, and here again in this case, over the years, you see, the Sabbath law had, had additional laws and guidelines placed upon it by the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. They had come up with a series of man-made uh, parameters that kind of explained how the Sabbath law was to work. So, you know, you could uh, rescue a cow or something that fell into a well. You know, you could do that. But um, you couldn't pick heads of grain as you traveled through the fields because you were hungry. See, they made the law into something that was not made for man, but was made for the sake of the law. They interpreted how God could work they interpreted how God would not work. They interpreted how things would go in fleshly self-righteousness so they could categorize people and judge according to the rules that they had made up. It's all about power and control. But yet, when it came to being compassionate, because it violated a principle that they had created, a religious principle that they had created to be followed. They neglected mercy.
See, they elevated their own rules above God's instructions. And anyone who didn't strictly adhere to their rules on to how you should do religion, they were criticized and considered to be subservient and unrighteous. So for the Pharisees, sadly, this act of healing was considered a, a, an act of work to be avoided on the Sabbath day rather than a work of mercy and thanksgiving to God to be embraced. Now you see, Jesus purposely did certain miracles throughout the New Testament on the Sabbath day because he's trying to make a point. You see, a man born blind receiving his sight from the Messiah. This is something to be rejoiced in, yet they found themselves criticizing the Messiah because the God that they thought they knew was not the God that they saw because he violated one of their man-made rules. How sad. See, the truth of the matter is God has never stopped showing works of mercy towards people in need. Sabbath or not, when a person is in need and they cry out to the Lord, He will meet them. And I dare say, on a Sabbath day, if we see someone in need, we meet the need too. That is, you see, the Pharisees had the letter of this law caught in their head, but they missed the whole point of it. And this is why Matthew 16, 6, Jesus says this to his disciples. Because there's a very real danger that we can get caught up the same way as the Pharisees did. Because we like to explain things in nice, neat little boxes, sometimes we can take what God does and categorize it according to our own traditions and miss the whole point of what the Word of God is trying to say. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 6, Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You see, the reason Jesus warned his disciples about this and the reason why there's the warning that goes out to the church today too is that a small amount of poison from false teaching from the, from the school of the Pharisees and Sadducees is enough to spread throughout the whole heart of a person and ruin it and taint it to the point where it doesn't bear the fruit that God desires. Jesus warned his disciples not to accept their false teachings, and the same warning goes to us today. None of us who have been believers for a while are exempt from being tainted by the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I stand here today, and I would admit to you, that over the years, there have been times where I've fallen into this sin. I admit it. I don't want anything to do with it. But it's easy for us to get captured by this particular sin. And really, the yeast of Pharisees and Sadducees comes down and it boils down to one sin at the very core of it. And that is the sin of human pride. By nature, we like things to go our way. By nature, we like to have a grip on reality. By nature, we like to think that we understand how we should live our lives. And by nature, we want to be our own masters. Now, I'm not saying that we live undisciplined lives, that we go around you know, not having self-control and not thinking about what we should do and what we shouldn't do. I'm not saying that at all. But you see, by nature, we like to make up the rules to our own game so that we can fit God in a way that we can understand Him. And sometimes we close Him off so that we don't, we don't see Him beyond the scope of what our experience and teaching is. And we've got to be very careful about false teaching. Okay? 
Because there's some false teaching out there where people extrapolate their own thoughts and feelings about um, about theology and the Word of God is violated. Okay, no, that that's not what we're talking about here today. Okay, we're talking about when we live our Christian lives and we look at the Scriptures, but we take the Scriptures and 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 and, and we we say, okay, God. I think I got this. This is how you work. This is how I think you're going to work. And if you don't work in these things, then it's not of you. Well, you know something? It's supernatural because it's supernatural. God is a supernatural God. He can do things the way he desires to do them, and he can blow our theories out of the water if he wants to. So we've got to be very careful that we don't have this yeast of control where we think we can control the parameters. Now, the parameters are set in the Word of God, right? The parameters are set in the Word of God. But what I'm saying is sometimes we look at the Word of God and we can interpret the Word of God according to the lenses that we want because we're not open to the supernatural. These guys were studied in the Old Testament. Jesus opened the eyes of this blind man that had been blind since birth, and yet they wouldn't believe. Why? Because according to what they had thought and taught, been taught in the schools of thinking that they had, this was not possible. This was not possible. God, you would never heal someone on the Sabbath. What an absurd thought. The God of all creation can't heal someone on the Sabbath? It's absurd. When you think about it, their interpretation of that law of keeping the Sabbath and not working was flat out wrong. We've got to be careful. See, a little bit of Pharisee in me can contaminate my whole heart. It can negatively spread through my entire life. Puff me up with the yeast of human pride. Do I know it all? Absolutely not. Like, honestly, I study the Scriptures a lot. But the more I study the Scriptures, the more I realize how fathomlessly, infinitely powerful and knowledgeable God is so much above where I am. I'm an ant. I'm, my understanding is so very limited. And so is yours. Let's not get too proud if God wants to raise the dead, he will raise the dead. If God wants to take a blind man's eyes and open his eyes, he will do it. But God never does what he does without reasons. You see, it's a, we must be careful we don't just pursue adherence to the letter of how we interpret God's words through our own faith tradition but neglect its spirit and its purpose. Hmm. The yeast of the Pharisees roosting in us will lead to self-righteousness, critical thinking, and cynical viewpoints instead of the fruit of the Spirit, which Paul tells us in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Well, Pastor Clint, since we're on the subject, what is this yeast? How do I know if I've been corrupted by it? There's no easy answers to this because there's a very, I'm probably not going to hit all the things, but there are certain signs that appear in our hearts. And I, you know, the tendency is when we hear this stuff is to go, hmm, what about my neighbor? <laughs> You know, I know a guy that's just like that. Or I know a girl who's just like that. Well, when we look at this, okay, when Jesus said, don't, you know, be aware of the yeast of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, be aware, be aware of it, what he's saying to the individual disciple is you need to be aware of it. This isn't for somebody else. This is for me to reflect on. And sometimes when the Word of God teaches us, we just have to stand back and go, you know what, Lord? Take the lens, 
Put it on me. Illuminate it, Lord. Is there anything in my heart that that's just needs some adjustment that I need to repent of? Have I given way to this thing? I know there's been times when I have. So, do I, here, for instance, there's a couple of questions I think we can ask to see if maybe we've got tainted a little bit by this, or maybe a lot. Do I believe that showing up for Sunday worship makes me right with God? The Bible says, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together or some in the habit of doing, and there's good reason for it. It's good for us to be together with God's people. And the Lord knows it. And He wants us to be consistent with that so we can give each other encouragement as we see the day approaching. That's the purpose. But do I believe that showing up for worship every Sunday makes me right with God? Is that what makes me right with God? I mean, it's good for us to be consistent, but do I believe the act of attending makes me right with God? Hey, what is, how are we saved? By grace, through faith. This is not of yourselves. It's not of your works, lest anyone should boast. I don't deserve God's grace, and neither do you. But nevertheless, it is given freely and abundantly. God's grace for salvation and God's grace for living is given to us in more than enough portion to meet all of the need. But I'm not made righteous by the act of attending church. Do I spend more time talking about what am I against than what I am for? If I do, it's a little check mark. Maybe I need to think about this, Lord. Am I talking more about what I'm against than what I'm for? Do I believe that God needs me? Without me, the, the gospel wouldn't go forward in this community. Without me, you know, there wouldn't be any light in my workplace. Without me, is that something that I've come to? Well, yes, the Lord desires us to know Him and to walk with Him. But you know what? God doesn't need me. He can do things through a donkey the same way as He can do through me. He doesn't need us, but He loves us. So I'm not saying because He doesn't need us that He doesn't love us. He desires us to walk closely with Him and He desires to share with us in His work so that we can experience the joy of His work. But He doesn't need me. He doesn't need us. If I've got this high opinion of myself, <laughs> it's another mark. Maybe I have a bit of yeast of that Pharisee in me. Do I make issue every time of white and black and have no room for gray? Is it my way or the highway on certain things all the time? If there's gray issues, are they gray? What's gray? There's black and white issues and there's gray. There's matters of absolute truth in the Word of God, which are black and white. No compromise there. What's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. But there are matters of conscience. There are matters of preference. Maybe I like this kind of music, or I like that kind of music, or I like this kind of translation of the Bible, or I like that kind of translation of the Bible. Maybe I think I should dress this way or dress that way. Or There's so many different... Do I eat meat or am I a vegetarian? Do I drink alcohol or do I don't? Do I not? All these issues are issues of gray and matters of conscience. And sometimes, in the mind of Pharisees, there is no gray. It's all black and white. I'm right and you're wrong. Because my school of thinking was correct, and yours is flawed. Ooh, okay. Be careful. When you see this inside, be careful. Do I secretly condone in private what I preach against in public? What's going on behind closed doors? Am I saying one thing out of this side of my mouth 
and this this a totally opposite thing out of this side of my mouth? Does my lifestyle match my theology? What am I watching? What am I listening to? What kind of music do I listen to? Am I listening to about music where guys are sleeping around on their wives and 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 uh, partying all night and having rock and roll? You know, I see these matters. Okay, are matters of conscience to a certain extent on different thing on different styles, but when it comes to the content, it's very much, you know, it's very much black and white. How am I carrying myself? Am I divided in heart? The Pharisees, they paid so much, they, they paid so much attention to their pet sins, but yet they gave way to the sins that uh, they thought they should be able to just, God would be okay with. You know, they toler God will tolerate that. And maybe they didn't even think of it as that. Maybe they thought, oh my, I'm right. And um, I'm good. Is my salvation based on my good works and observance of the laws and not on Jesus? I don't drink, smoke, or chew or go out with girls who do. Is that, my, is that what makes me righteous? Is that what makes me righteous? Well, by your, act, by your, by your works, they shall know you. So... That's a good litmus test. But that's not what makes you righteous. What makes you righteous is what we just celebrated here with remembering what Christ did. What makes me righteous is not whether I don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go out with girls who do. That's not what makes me righteous. Yet that may be, that may be an effect of the righteousness of God in Christ inside of me where I no longer am, am desiring the things of this world, the sins, sinful pleasures of this world. The Bible says repent. The Bible says repent. We must have a heart of repentance before we can come to the Lord. To believe, he says, if you believe me, you will obey me. So true faith in Christ is accompanied by repentance. But that is, you see, not doing certain things or doing certain things is not what saves us. It is the blood and broken body, the sacrificial work of Christ that saves us. And after we're saved, the lights get turned on and all things are made new. And I turn my back on the things that I used to do. And I'm like, I don't want that anymore. I want you, Jesus. I want you, Lord. Okay, we need to ask ourselves these questions. Am I reading my Bible to substantiate my convictions rather than reading the Bible to be shaped into God's image? This is a question. Hey, I've been guilty of this. I'm looking to substantiate. Well, what is it when I read the Word of God? What is it that you're saying, God? Where do I need to change? Until we get down to the, into glory, folks, we need spiritual growth. Spiritual growth means we have flaws. If, we're not, if we don't have any flaws, we don't need to grow spiritually. We've got, we, we're, we're perfect. We don't have to reform anything. Well, I would suggest that, that the Christian walk is, is a walk where we are conformed to the image of Christ. Am I cynical of new things, unique things that God might be doing in and through people that are different than things I've been schooled in in the past? It's a good question. Do I have a problem believing in God and His sovereignty? Might do things a little different than what I think in order to get someone's attention, in order to bring glory to himself in order to win someone? Do all of my friends look and act just like I do? Or am I open to extending the hand of friendship to people that are different than me? When people walk through the doors of this assembly, there shouldn't be a person here that's gone through a service and leaves this building without someone coming up to them and, and checking 
and seeing how they're doing and letting them know that they're welcome. Lord, help us to have eyes outside of ourselves, outside of our circles, so we can see the people that might need a touch from God. God, make us sensitive to this. Hmm. If someone tries to correct me in a pattern of thinking, do I get easily angered and offended? Well, sometimes, yeah, I do. Have I got a hard time sometimes accepting the fact that I'm going to always be right? Uh huh. That's me. I admit this. These are some of the things that I've struggled with. I don't want to struggle. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to miss what God is trying to say in the environment that God has placed me. And I trust that you don't either. See, because the Pharisees' preconceived man-made ideas on how God operates in any given situation, they had no flexibility for what God wanted to do supernaturally amongst the people. Even though the evidence was right in front of them, they dug in. John 9, 18 to 24, they still did not believe that he had been blind and had received a sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now that he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. See, in Jewish culture there, their synagogue was the center of their community. They didn't want to lose their community life. And there's a possibility if they answered wrong, they'd be kicked out of their community. And... A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know is I was blind, and now I see. So the Pharisees didn't call out Jesus because he broke some law of the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus didn't do things the way that they thought he should. And if they would have looked at the law in Scripture, they would have understood that he did no wrong. Jesus claimed to be God and he didn't obey their man-made theology traditions. They said what they said despite the evidence, not because of it. And the man who was healed gave glory to Jesus. He says, I don't know where he comes from. I don't know. You're saying he's a sinner. I don't know if he was or wasn't, but look at the evidence here. Like, I was blind, and now I see. And they went so far, really, to call the healed man a liar. There's a lesson in this for us as well. When it comes to discerning what is from God and what we don't understand, we must be careful that our own traditions do not make us blind to the truth that God has done something. We must be careful. Now, God might just blow the narrative and do something yeah, crazy miraculous. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answers, I have 
told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? It was absurd to this man that these guys were doing this. It was totally absurd. When God does something miraculous in someone's life, they know it. And when someone says, ah, you know what? Nah, that's just coincidence or some, some other reason. This man was blind from birth. His hearing was really sharp. <laughs> You can imagine, if you only had four senses instead of five, your four senses that are working would be sharpened. They'd be extraordinarily sharp, right? Well, he's, this guy's listening to these Pharisees and Sadducees or whoever they were, trying to have him discredit Jesus. This man understood that they had no interest at all in knowing the truth. They weren't interested in the truth. They were uninterested in substantiating their own thoughts and feelings. They had an agenda, and he recognized how silly it was. So knowing they didn't want to hear about it to praise God, he, he kind of jested with them. He's like, if you want to hear the story again, are you guys wanting to become his disciples or what? Well, huh. he poked the bear. Of course, they didn't want to learn. They were there to make a point. And this drew immediate reaction from them. Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We, don't, we know that God spoke to Moses, but as far for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Well, this even perplexed the man further. He's like, wow. He says, the man answered, now that is remarkable. That is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. The beggar who had been healed by Jesus, how remarkable it was that he could now see. He had never been able to see. Now he could, he could greet people and he could see flowers and trees. All this stuff was in, right there. And he's like, how can you not understand that this is from God. This is remarkable. Imagine never having seen the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset or the flowers, the rising, the face of the rising or the setting of the sun, right? Imagine not, never being able to see that. Imagine never being able to see the face of your father, your mother, your sister, your brothers, the people that befriended you. Imagine that. Now he could see. Yet instead of rejoicing, here's these Pharisees, these religious leaders, filled with jealousy, resentment, and anger. And the man who, touched, who was touched by Jesus, he knew. With this logic, he continued speaking with them. This guy had never been trained in the theological seminaries of the religious leaders. He couldn't see, and they didn't have Braille back then. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, the man says. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of the opening of, a, of the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Ouch, poke the bear again. <laughs> you see, these guys, if they would have stopped to think... You know, not all the Pharisees were, were um, in the same mindset. There's people like Nicodemus that came to Jesus by night. And, and, and there's people like Gamaliel who said, you know, um, in the New Testament after Jesus ascended, man, let these guys be. If you're, if you, if you're doing something against them, you just might find yourself fighting against the hand of God. If God, if these people aren't of God, God's, God's big enough to take care of the problem. He can take care of this. But most of these Pharisees, unbelievable. 
They were so arrogant in their beliefs how, how things should or shouldn't go. They wanted to attribute the supernatural work of God to Satan. Rather than admit they were wrong, they had to come up with another explanation. This work is not of God, it's, it must be of the devil. The heels man, man continues his comments. And that, that kind of pushed them to the edge of their pride. That, that was like, their pride was like, okay, enough is enough, dude. You've gone too far now. You, you have offended us. How dare you? To this they replied. To this they replied. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So here's this guy, blind from birth. All he's doing is like, thank you, Lord, for healing me, for giving me sight. And because he wouldn't play the Pharisees' game and say that Jesus was not the reason, they called him steeped in sin at birth and said, how dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus didn't have the same theology as they had, did he? <laughs> Jesus is the source of theology. What did he say earlier in this? They're like, they were asking the question, well, is this guy crippled or is this guy blind because of some sin of his parents or his own sin? And Jesus is like, no, it was neither this man's sin nor the sin of his parents. But this was this man was born this way so that God could receive glory in the end. God can receive glory in marvelous different ways. And it's not all what you think. Jesus said that this man was going to be a living, breathing glory to God. It's really grievous sin when people attribute the work of God to Satan. In fact, this sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. On another occasion where Jesus had miraculously cast a demon out of a man, the Pharisees said that it happened because Jesus was possessed by the prince of demons. That's why he could cast out the demon. In Matthew 12, 30 and 31, or 30 to 32, I should say, whoever is not with me, Jesus said, is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. The ultimate blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to reject Christ. To reject Christ. Lots of people commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit the path is wide to destruction, and many there are that follow it. This should cause us to weep inside. It breaks the heart of God to see that people are disobedient. And in this case, these men, they had good intentions to do what they did, but they took it to a sinful place. See, the Pharisees try, they, they tried to make the law of Moses very applicable to the lives of the people from what they saw. But in the process of doing it, their interpretation went off. The problem was their interpretation and explanation and application became equal to the Scripture itself. That's why what I'm saying, what any man says, whatever commentary you have to read, whatever book you are reading, you need to read it with this understanding. God, help me to strain out the stuff that isn't right and help me to absorb the things that are right. And I pray, and a lot of other teachers pray this too, that God would use them to teach things that are right what I teach must always be measured against the Word of God in context. And if I'm wrong, please come talk to me. I'm not always going to be perfectly on as your pastor. 
there's going to be times where I need someone to say to me, hey, what about this? Have you thought about this? And you know, if I'm a true man of God, I'm going to go, you know what? Let me weigh that. And maybe the answer is, yeah, I need to adjust my thinking on this point. But I say this because you, you guys are in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. We've got to be very careful how we live. We've got to watch our life and doctrine closely. There can be teachers and books that are very passionate about certain points, and they can miss the whole spirit of what God was trying to say in his word through it, through what they're, they're forming. So be very careful. That's just a side point. So we must be aware of the yeast of the Pharisees. We must be careful not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Now the Pharisees here, they believed their thoughts on God were above this man's and above Jesus' thoughts on God, even though Jesus was God and they didn't recognize him. How could anyone, the question is, be steeped in sin any more than anyone else? When we're born into the world, we're born into sin. We're born as, into, as a sinful nature. We, we're given a sinful nature. Psalm 51.5 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. The Apostle stated, Apostle Paul stated in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, this being the case, okay, I just want to mention this. We're sinful at birth, but sin is not always held in an account, to account. When a baby is born, they don't innately understand right from wrong. Do you think God's going to judge that? No, he's not going to judge that. Of course not. He, he would be unjust if he did. Someone who is born with disabilities, mental disabilities, and they don't understand and they live their whole lives crippled with a mental disability, do you think God's going to throw that person into hell? Well, the Bible says in Romans 5.13, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. So that's why we would say that a child, before they reach an age of accountability, even though they have a sin nature and they're sinners, it's not held against them. It's not held to account. It's not charged to anyone's account when there is no law. There's no understanding. And now there might be someone out there that disagrees with that, but that's how I, I believe God intends his word to be interpreted here. The grievous sin that the religious leaders were committing was that indirectly they were saying, that they knew more than anyone else. Self-righteous indignation and pride was at the center of what they spoke. So in their self-indignation and pride, the man that had been blind since birth that Jesus healed, they kicked him out of the synagogue. Jesus heard in verse 35 that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me that I might believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. <laughs> Isn't this a beautiful story? It's a beautiful story. God decides to heal or do something supernatural in a miracle. And he does it with eternal purpose in mind. This blind man was blinded both physically and spiritually. And the fact that Jesus is able to open blind eyes in the physical means that he is also Lord to be able to open the blind eyes of a person in the spiritual as well. God's not ceasing to do his work even today. He doesn't physically heal people in every circumstance, but don't kid yourself. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same. Forever to be praised. God can heal physically if He chooses to do that. 
if it, if, if it fulfills his purpose. Sometimes God wants to take people home. Sometimes people have thorns in their flesh that they have to suffer with because it keeps their eyes off of themselves and onto God. Sometimes I've had to suffer, I know. Maybe you have too. Because you know God's trying to teach you something through it. Suffering and pain and, and adversity is a great teacher. It really is. As much as we don't like it. But the message in this passage is clear. You see, if unlike the Pharisees, we humble ourselves before the Lord and admit that we are blind, that we are sinful, and that we need Jesus to save us, that's when we can be saved. The Spirit convicts us. And when the Spirit convicts us, don't turn away. Don't push away. If the Spirit is convicting you, don't push away. Yield to the Spirit. Yield to His voice. And you will be saved. You need to believe in Jesus, folks. That He is who He said He is. That He is God's Messiah. Be willing to repent, to turn away from the sinful life that you are living and to follow Him. He who wants to follow Christ must pick up his cross and follow him. That means die to myself and follow him. If you're listening today on the internet, if you don't know Jesus, you can know him right now. If you, need, you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And in believing in Jesus, you admit that you are a sinner and that you need salvation from God. And if you do that and you and you turn to him, and you pick up your cross, and you allow him to take your life, he will save you and transform you. And I pray that we will also be open to the fact that God might do things differently. As Christians, let's ask God to have his way. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Make me and mold me after thy will while I am waiting, yielded and still. That old hymn, that old hymn has powerful lyrics. It's not, Lord, conform to my own way. Lord, conform to my own way. No, it's have thine own way. So let's, let's ask the Lord to purge us from any kind of thing that we find that might be leading us to have this pharisaical attitude. We're not, none of us are exempt from being tempted by these things. None of us are exempt from falling into the pitfall of having a pharisaical attitude. As soon as we think that we're above that, hmm, maybe I, <laughs> I have that problem, right? So, humbly walk before God. We need, don't we need His grace today? Amen? We need His grace every hour. Every minute, every second of every day. And he's great. his grace is, is freely given to us. He offers it. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you teach us. We thank you that you give us insight. We see the story of how you make blinded eyes see and how beautiful it is, God, that you do your work. How you transform people from darkness and to light, both in the physical and in the spiritual. And for those that have blinded eyes now, Lord, if they believe in you one day, Father, either here on this side or on the other side, they will see. And we thank you for that, Lord, that you have you've done great things and you continue to do good things in your people. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. May God's grace and peace rest on you. Have a great week.